Season 4 Beyond the Plate is presented by Martin's Famous Potato Rolls. Hey everyone, before I get into Martin's, a little heads up for you all on Cook Tracks. You probably saw these six episodes pop up into your feed if you are a subscriber to Beyond the Plate. What is Cook Tracks? Cook Tracks is, well, essentially it's a brand new way to cook. This is a project we at the Beyond the Plate team have been working on with our buddy Rachel Ray, who you'll hear from in this episode. And in each episode, a chef or culinary personality is right alongside you or in your ear we should say. They're going to be taking you step by step through a dish or a meal in real time. So you're going to hear tips and tricks and stories to keep you entertained and they're going to help you up your cooking game a little bit. So you don't need to read a recipe. You really don't need to pause, but you can. And there's no playing a video and stopping and starting. You'll get a list of ingredients, which you could see in the episode notes on each episode, or you could go to cooktracks.com. So join in, have some fun, follow along. At the end of every episode, you'll have made a complete dish or a meal from start to finish. So there's six episodes, as I mentioned. We have some of the best chefs and cooks we know. Rachel Ray is doing two. Gail Simmons is doing one. Rocco Despirito, Stephanie Iser, Jimmy Papadopoulos. Anyway, for more information and updates, again, check out cooktracks.com or you will see them on whatever platform you are listening to this podcast on. All right, more on our friends at Martin's Famous Potato Rolls. Martin's was founded in the heart of Pennsylvania Dutch country in 1955. They're the number one branded hamburger bun in America. As I like to say, they can make almost any burger taste better. They really can. I'm focusing on something different than their potato rolls. I'm going to tell you about their breakfast breads. Check these out at their website or in your local market if they carry them. If they don't carry them, ask for them. They're insane. They've always had a cinnamon raisin bread, but they have these new-ish cinnamon sugar swirl potato bread, maple brown sugar swirl potato bread, cinnamon raisin butter bread. They're unbelievable. You could eat slices right out of the bag, but the sky's the limit. French toast, breakfast casseroles, anything. Check those out. But here's what I love about Martin's. Martin's believes in giving back to their community. They support hundreds of charitable organizations, food banks, after school programs, disaster relief, and more. To learn more about Martin's, visit their website at potatorolls.com or check them out on social media at potatorolls. Martin's, we thank you. That's how Yummo started. I said, oh my God, that's good. And I offended people because I said, God. And I'm like, I didn't damn the food. I just said, oh my God, that's good. So I'd say yum. And instead of saying, oh my God, I would have to stop myself. So I'd say yum, oh, and then say stop. It wasn't like I came up with yummo, like that's a cute phrase. I was trying to say yum, oh my God, but I had to stop saying, oh my God. Welcome to Beyond the Plate, a podcast where we sit down with the world's culinary elite to explore their journey with food and their passion for giving back. I'm Cappy, and in this week's episode, we sat with Miss Rachel Ray. She is our first repeat offender, everyone, our first guest that we are interviewing again. Check out her full episode from season one, episode one. Great feedback on it. If you haven't heard that, be sure to check that out. Do I need to give a bio on this multi Emmy award winning TV star, this iconic Food Network personality, this best selling cookbook author who's about to release her 26th cookbook, this founder and editorial director of her own lifestyle magazine, Rachel Ray Every Day, this overly generous founder of the Yummo organization and the Rachel Ray Foundation? Okay, I won't give a bio. Anyhow, we discuss three things in this episode. We discuss her brand new cookbook, RR50, which is amazing. It's available for pre-order now. We discuss cook tracks and we discuss the 30 minute meals reboot. As you know, we usually talk about how our guests give back. We don't cover this specifically in this episode, but for those that don't know, Rachel has given many, many, many millions of dollars away to various animal organizations as well as cooking and kids organizations. Now, while I like to say it's not always about the money, the impact she's made behind the scenes for these two different causes is truly 
really incredible. So check that out if you don't know too much about it. We also cover it, as I mentioned, in season one, episode one. Anyhow, I'll stop here. Please enjoy this conversation as we go beyond the plate with Rachel and Dominica Ray. Blah, 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 blah. That uh, sounds really professional, Cappy. I'm, I'm very professional, Rachel. Ready? <laughs> For what? You're just talking, right? Yeah. <laughs> but here's what's going on. Okay, what's going on? I'm setting my timer for 30 minutes. Oh, good. And when the timer beeps, Mm -hmm. we're done. Wow. Where'd you get that idea? Well. Thinking of me in 30 minutes? Huh. (laughs) No idea how you connected those two dots. It's just this idea I had. May make a TV show out of it one day. Maybe not. (laughs) All right. We have an agenda. Our agenda is... You have an agenda. I have an agenda. The agenda is new book, cook tracks, and 30-minute meals. And the timer starts now. But first, a speed round out of the gates. Oh, (laughs) no. I'm terrible at these. (laughs) I hate those two words, speed round. What what, did you have for dinner last night? I feel like I'm like on the clock, and I am on the clock. Last night, we took friends to Missy because we were at Beyond the Streets, an amazing exhibit out in Brooklyn of uh, street artists turned fine artists. It, It was incredible. And Missy is right next door to that. 10 vegetables, 10 pastas, fabulous. Miss Robin's place, of course. Tonight, I am making swordfish cutlets and pasta a la norma. You know, eggplant, uh, cherry tomatoes from my garden, Calabrian chili paste, a little red vermouth, torn basil. Nice. Last thing you cooked that you thought, damn, I'm good. Pepperoni. I just gave you a taste of it. Explain. Pepperoni tastes like pepperoni, but it is a meat-free product. And uh, I tasted this delicious paste in the Union Square Green Market that was supposed to be like a Calabrian salami paste in Julia. And I didn't, I, I didn't think it had the same punch. So of course I became obsessed with going home and making my own. So I came up with one that I think really does taste like salami sauce. It's delicious. It's uh, miso paste, red miso paste in equal amounts with sun-dried tomato paste and tomato paste and white wine vinegar, lemon juice, a uh, couple of fat cloves of garlic and pimenton or smoked paprika. And dang, if it doesn't taste like pepperoni. I call it pepperoni. Yeah, I love it. Cute. Last thing you cooked that you thought, nah, that was good, but next time I think I'm going to tweak it. I don't know. I mean, I don't really, I don't think about food in those terms. I mean, I know that over the years I've cooked things where I'm like, yeah, I'm not going to bother with that again. Uh, stinging nettles pasta. Okay. Like, no. Yeah. (laughs) You know, the gloves, the the big gloves, the whole, it's just, it's too much work. And I thought it tasted bland and not, I I love seeing Nettles cheese, but I know the lady who makes it, so why bother? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So if I, if I get the need for a Nettle, I take it in cheese rather than making the pasta. But generally speaking, I work by request and I think a lot of cooks do, cooks slash chefs. I know the taste buds of the people that I cook for. So no matter what I'm cooking, whatever the protein is, whatever the vegetable is, I know how to make it taste good. Yeah. Do do you see what I'm saying? Totally, yeah. So it's rare that I make something where I'm like, oh, that's just completely inedible. Plus, we set our bar pretty low in our house. (laughs) We eat just about anything. And we're like, you're hungry enough. You're like, oh, that's good. (laughs) (laughs) What's the last most impressive meal you had? At a restaurant. There's a lot of great meals in New York. And I'm, again, I can be impressed with really simple things. You know, a frozen Negroni, bocce in the park over here. Missy's Place, I love her vegetables. Like, everybody goes there for the pastas. I actually go there, like, craving her grilled runner beans. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, her pile of uh, artichokes, you know, charred artichokes uh, in, in... Sauce. And, Those are good. Yeah, you know, I I really look forward to going there for the vegetables. I love Olmsted and Maison Yakitori, <laughs> French Yakitori place, which I, I love juxtapositions like that. Yeah. Places that have a sense of humor and Olmsted, like Greg Backstrom, is just such a talented. That that place knocks me out. That's I great. love it. I think it's the most original restaurant in New York. I love going to Olmsted. It really surprises me every time. Did you do but brunch there yet? 
I haven't done brunch Neither there yet. I. It's hard for me to get out of the house. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And it, it, when we do brunch, it's like on a Sunday, and that's like CBS Sunday morning, right. and we have a certain routine. John usually puts in brunch requests. I did make brunch today, actually. I made, I put the pepperoni paste with some beautiful um, small dandelion greens, organic dandelion greens, and uh, egg and provolone on a roll. It was really good. I offered you some, and you said no, that you had just eaten. I Thanks. Should. That made me feel really great, by the way. Ass. <laughs> you are an ass. <laughs> <laughs> Last song you rocked out to. I love Beck, uh, because I'm going to go see him on Tuesday night. I love Beck Saw Lightning, and his whole new album uh, is a partnership with, or a pair up with Pharrell, so I'm really excited about that. Uh, I love the tours. I've been listening to them a lot. Of course, The Cringe has their new album, My Husband's Band, and I think it's excellent. I really do. It's just fantastic. And it's really diverse. It's a little bit of something for everyone. And he has one song on there that's a duet with our friend Bob Schneider, so I really enjoy that. You know me. I listen to all types of music. Uh, This morning, I ran to uh, kind of an 80s mix with like Echo and the Bunnymen and Psychedelic Furs and... Lots of Elvis Costello and R.E.M. And it, That's cool. Yeah, it was really it was fun. So fun mix. Obviously, you know, I make T-shirts and that's how we met. Exceptional T-shirts. Thank you. I'm hoping for a new wardrobe of T-shirts for my birthday. Well, it's funny you should which ask. Which is coming up. It's funny you should ask. If I made a shirt just for you today with an ingredient on it, what would it say? Pepperoni. <laughs> <laughs> I see a theme here of this episode. Let's see how many times we could fit this. <laughs> no, I think it would be E-V-O-O, obviously, because I got into the dictionary with it. But I like it. Like, if you were going to make me a T-shirt, I want to know what you would put on the T-shirt. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's more interesting for me as the person receiving a gift to get your take on right. me than to, for me to give you my take and say, give me that. Yeah. Like, I've never been a girlfriend or a wife or e- uh, even a daughter. I've never been to my parents or my friends or my boyfriends or my husband, I want this. Do you know what I mean? Unless it was something really practical, like we need a new carpet sweeper for the kitchen. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Like it's, that's, that's, that's the best. Like I'm more excited to open something where I really have no idea what's in the box. Right. You know, and I'm somebody who gets excited about socks and pajamas and like, like I just love the idea of not knowing what's in the box. Yeah. I mean, not in a creepy way, not in a seven, you know, what's in the box? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not in a Brad Pitt, um, going to the other way, but. <laughs> Okay. So we sat down when we first did the podcast season one, it was over two years ago. Congratulations. Why? Thank you. Has anything changed in the way you approach cooking? Oh, I constantly evolve as a, as a person who cooks for a living. I think it's your job to. I'm not trying to just service myself. And even if I was that just cooking for my family, you know, just cooking for myself and my friends or my family, I think that you have to challenge yourself. If you enjoy food, whether it's a hobby or your job, that's the fun of it is that you're always evolving. I I wouldn't have come up with pepperoni (laughs) had I not been trying to write a lot of meat free recipes. And I've been playing around, as you know, with um, meat alternatives and sausage alternatives. My own mother, my Sicilian mother who lived on pasta and sausage and meat, like, uh, rah, 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 you know, she'd eat like literally a wheel of cheese, not a piece of cheese. But my own mother has turned at 84, um, she just turned 85. At 84, she went vegetarian. I mean, she still has moments where she's like, oh, I'll just have a taste of the lamb. <laughs> you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. But, For the most part, she went veg head on me and doesn't even eat pasta anymore, which like breaks my heart. But, you know, cool for her that she's evolving as a person, you know, at 84. So I'm I'm constantly trying to read from all over the world and push myself to to try new products and try new avenues um, because that's the fun of it. It's, you know, it's like if you pay to go to the gym, don't only do one thing at the gym all the time for Two years, yeah. You know, play with all the toys. Yeah, that's interesting because when I tell people how many different food publications you read, whether online or physical magazines from other countries, I mean, I'm looking at your bag you carry around, and oh, there's obsessed. magazines sticking out I'm of obsessed. them now. Uh, and and I buy um, I buy magazines in languages I can't speak. 
I just look at the pictures and I can get it. I yeah. just see what people are eating around the globe. And I buy a lot of American uh, publications too. Uh, Savor, Milk Street, my dear friend Chris is amazing. Uh, I, I have a ton of, of magazine subscriptions. I love to know what people are doing and eating and thinking. Yeah. And then I use that as a springboard to do my own take on that. All right. RR50 book. Weird, right? Two of my friends, TC, Tommy Crudup, and Michael Schlau, both said very similar things to me around when I turned 49. They said, oh, you're going to be 50. Tommy said you should write 50 recipes in your, like, 50 favorite memories over your life. And Michael said, you know, I would love to see a book where you write about yourself, not just a bunch of recipes. And I'm like, well, that's kind of creepy. I'm not a memoir kind of a gal. And I'm a person who's very positive-minded. Like, I don't like to reflect on negative energy. I like to just think about what I've learned, and I like to move forward. So I'm not someone who wants to sit down and just go through every moment of my life. Plus, I talk way too much. Like, people already know probably more than they need to or <laughs> want to about me. But I decided to just sit down and see if I wanted to get a few things down on paper. And I ended up with about, oh, 24, 25 essays about my life that I thought were, you know, funny, but also showed some sort of point and talked about what I think the, the, the meaning I have found in, in life has been so far. And then relating it to food that I private food, food that I make for people when we're in Italy, food that I make in my home that I wouldn't necessarily teach on television, food that may be too elaborate to do in uh, short cooking segments. You know, I don't always cook in 30 minutes. Sometimes I cook things that take many days, like the porchetta. I was going to say, your porchetta doesn't take four days. John's takes four days, yeah. So uh, I wanted to share a little bit about myself um, and what I've learned in 50 years. And I also wanted to share a different type of, of, of recipe with people. So that's what I did. Yeah. I wrote a couple of chapters and I gave it um, to our publisher, a lovely lady named Pam Cannon. And she said, no, I, I'm really interested in this. And I think that people would be too. I mean, after 20 something, 23, 24 books, I'm like, Ugh, isn't there any, no, nobody's going to buy it? this. Is it, I, is it 26? I don't know. It's a lot. It's a lot. It I, is. It's a lot of notebooks. Yeah. Think about how many hundreds and maybe thousands of notebooks that is. I write everything in notebooks first. So Do you keep every notebook? I do. Like some of them have been, you know, hit by flooded cellars and stuff over the years. But yeah, I have boxes and boxes and shelves and shelves and shelves and shelves of notebooks and all my old computers too. It's weird because sometimes just for fun, I'll look back at old notebooks and I'll be like, huh, how come I don't make that anymore? That was delicious. Yeah. Like stuff that you haven't, you know, cause I'm, I'm writing so much all the time to keep up with the show and the magazine and, you know, just to keep up with work product. And now with the food network, I, I, I write an enormous amount of stuff and I don't even make all that stuff in my home. And sometimes I forget the stuff that I write for work. I'm like, I never make that corn pasta with jalapenos at home and it's so good. It's, it's, it's funny you say that because I find this commonality with people who have the, like the success you do or the work ethic you do in that they talk about moving forward, innovating, I'll use that word in a way and not like dwelling on yesterday per se. Right. You're always doing something different. You know, you're always you're, evolving in some way. Yeah. But in, but you, I think every cook has their own personality too. Like when you hear a band, U2 has changed so much over the decades that I've listened to them, but you always know it's U2 when yeah. you hear them, no yeah. matter how different one album is from the next. Yeah. You know, REM, you know, lot, very different directions. But you always know, you know, there's a signature. Sure. And I can tell you Michael Schlau's food, like, I, for sure. Yeah. But you talk about, like, seeing old notebooks, and I'm always like, I wonder if you would go back to, like, early, early, early 30 minute meals or whatnot and be like, huh, that dish, maybe I'll do this version of that. It's today. so funny. And then when you see people in grocery stores or stuff and they stop you and they say, oh, you know, my favorite recipe of yours is blah, blah, blah. Some of them go way back. Some of them go back like 20 years, yeah. like cashew chicken, yeah. cashew, God bless you, chicken. <laughs> you okay, know, so it's crazy. I, I read something you said, basically each of us changes a dish by how we prepare it for ourselves. Right. If you made carbonara, it's going to look and taste different than when I make carbonara. Yeah. So Even all, though 
there's one way to make carbonara. Yeah. You know what I mean? So you, but you said, then you go on to say, ultimately it's your hope that this book, the 50 book, leaves the reader with that quiet smile we all get after we eat our favorite comfort food. So basically you're going for the afterglow of a big bowl of spaghetti. Yes. <laughs> I want people to read what I wrote in this book and, and smile. Yeah. You know, like they tasted something good. Incidentally, there isn't one way to make a carbonara, but... I think traditional carbonara is only bacon, pancetta, eggs, and pasta. I don't think it should have cream. I don't think it should have a bunch of fall around. But every culture has that I do play around with it. Sometimes I use saffron in the the hot broth that I use to temper the eggs. And sometimes I'll add peas in the spring or, you know, whatever. But the building blocks are the same. Yeah. it's like matzo ball soup in exactly. Jewish tradition or adobo exactly. in Filipino. Exactly. They're not, there's not I one way. I think the building blocks of, of food are important uh, to learn, whether you're a home cook or you cook for a living. You have to have those building blocks and know, know where, the, where you, the lane is yeah. for what it is you're trying to prepare. And then you could be creative and have fun with it. Yeah. You know? What else gives you that afterglow, not food-related? I love to draw. I love foodles. There's some of my foodles in the book. I love to doodle and draw and paint. I love photography. I I love dogs, obviously, and animals of all kind and sizes. (laughs) Uh, I love horseback riding, but I don't get to do it very often. I love being out on the water, which is funny because I have very screwy ears. And I very rarely go swimming because ears, my ears ache. Water gets trapped in them. But I love being on the water. So that's that's odd. But <laughs> I love fall and everything to do with fall. I would sleep outside all night on my deck if I could. I mean, yeah. I have too many chores to do and too much work to do. But, <laughs> but I love being uh, in that kind of crisp weather and the smell of fall leaves and autumn and all that. I love Italy. I love Italy. I mean, I love every inch of Italy. I love Italy. I love Austin. I love anything I can do in Austin. I love Detroit. Um, Pittsburgh, love Pittsburgh, love Oakland. I love a lot of American cities that I don't think Americans spend enough time in. There's a lot of stuff I I love. I love to read. I love to read. I bought my apartment for its proximity to food and good shopping, you know, grocery shopping and and marketing. And Union Square Market is very near my, my apartment. And its proximity to The Strand, my favorite bookstore. Yeah. All right. Moving on. Cook Tracks. Cook Tracks. Cook Tracks. Woo! Well, have just popped, just popped on the uh, Beyond the Plate. You know, I only spell it T R A X. Do you? I, think, I do. I think it's way cooler, but you could spell it however you want. Since you, like you're the mastermind <laughs> behind it and all. But all right, yeah, Cook Tracks I think is awesome because it is a way for you to do a cook along that I think is more useful than watching a video in its current state. Like if you're watching 30 minute meals streaming on your computer, you have to keep looking away. And I don't say every single thing that I'm doing because I'm being videotaped. I mean, camera, you know, camera is filming me, digitally taped, let's say. So people can see what I'm doing so I don't, I don't get as specific as I could yeah. in telling you what to do. When you listen to someone else cook and they're talking you through it, it's pretty brilliant because you can just pop your buds in yeah. and cook. Like yeah. you just get all the stuff and you're like... Oh, okay. And I'm talking while I'm cooking. So we're cooking pretty much in real time, yeah. like in sync. Yeah. It's more synced up. What I like about it is that you can literally, in real time, gather your ingredients and cook along with me or whoever else. Yeah. So I'll just add on to it. We it just released six episodes, Netflix style. Um, on this platform, it'd be on the plate, so you'll see it if you download That's this so episode. Cool. And then Rachel did two episodes: the Pizza Ola Burger. Oh, that was good. And the peachy, you really liked that burger. It was so good with Pe- the hot honey. Yeah. Oh my god. And a peachy pasta dish. And yeah, then, but you could use any fat spaghetti. Yeah. And then uh, we have Gail Simmons who did her I ultimate love Gail. breakfast sandwich. Oh, she's amazing. We have Stephanie Izard who did an Love awesome like Asian style pancake, um, really good. 
And then we have Jimmy Papadopoulos, a chef in Chicago who's super talented. Oh, did he do the sandwich? The, the fr- fried, was chicken. It fried chicken. Yeah. Firebird that chicken was crazy. sandwich. I saw the picture of that thing. <laughs> you guys are going to have to unhinge your jaw <laughs> yeah. to bite that. Delicious. And then uh, Rocco Desperado. We oh, did Rocco! risotto with Rocco. Yay, so, Rocco's back on the blocko. Yeah, exactly. I mean, if, if you, he walks you through risotto and you will be a master. At That's it so by the time great. You see it. So it's, it's awesome. And I think, like, as you said, Rach, it's, you're, you're not going to watch a video and go back and forth and pause on this. And the point of this is you're, you have all the ingredients like on your table, you yeah, know, in or front of you and, and you can just keep along. working yeah. right with it. It's super fun. So yeah, check it out. It's extremely cool. Yeah. We're doing a feature on it. It's on the cover of the magazine and on the radar page. Yes. In the magazine. Yes. You could, you could hover your phone camera over it and it will take you right to uh, your episode, I think. All right, cruising along. 30 Minute Meals came back this After past 20 April. years. Crazy. Insane. And back again <clears throat> soon. Yes. Uh, so we did 30 for 30, the 30 days of April, celebrated the return of 30 new 30 Minute Meals. I guess that went over pretty well. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So Will and Grace, 90210, 30 Minute Meals, mm-hmm. all these reboots out there. What's different now than when you first filmed we it 20 years ago? And you know this, we legitimately can just straight film 30 minutes. When we first started 30 Minute Meals, cameras were much different and we had to rehearse each act so that the men wouldn't bump into each other. The, the camera guys would like literally like run into each other. You had to rehearse every act. It was always my food and it was always 30 minutes. They took my food out of the pan and we'd have to put it on a tray. Then we'd have to rehearse the next act. And then we'd have to heat the pan back up and put my food back in the pan. Because I was a real stickler about it has to be my food and it has to be 30 minutes. So we were filming a total of 30 minutes, but there wasn't the integrity that there is now. Now we literally set a master clock for 30 minutes and whatever happens, happens. And we roll on the whole thing. A few or several, I'm not sure how many, but some of the episodes Food Network put up on their digital platform and you just see all the raw footage. Like like SNL when they go to break Saturday Live, you see, you see what, what goes out, you see the reset. Yeah. They just roll on the whole thing. And sometimes I had to make up things or add a cocktail or something on the fly because I just couldn't fill the 30 minutes. Hmm. <laughs> um, but we did it like, boom, you know, it was really exciting. Uh, and we literally would film, reset, film, reset, film, reset, and do four shows between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. So if you needed to fill time with a cocktail or whatever it is, do you ever, did you ever come close to going over or do you usually err on being shorter? I try and write food that's doable for people in 30 minutes. So I tend to run shorter than longer. And I talk so much, I can fill that time with chit chat. Yeah. For me. Yeah. Like I could chop faster or do this quicker, but I'm taking my time to tell a story while I'm doing it. I try and make it doable as much as possible, of course. There's a couple of them. Like if I try and put a couple of courses into those 30 minutes, they get real exciting, like down to the last second. (laughs) And I tell you another thing that has changed. Food Network doesn't demand that I take a bite before the end of every show. Mm. You have no idea how many times I burn my mouth, my gullet, my esophagus. (laughs) I couldn't taste food for a week. Uh, You know, we have tears in my eyes because the food would be scorching, screaming, molten lava hot. And then you have to take the bite and say, and say mm. goodbye and say, <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. That's how Yummo started. I said, oh my God, that's good. And I offended people because I said, God, and I'm like, what I didn't, I didn't damn the food. Yeah. I just said, oh my God, that's good. Like I didn't, I didn't understand why that was offensive to some people, but it was. So I'd say yum. And instead of saying, oh my God, I would have to stop myself. So I'd say yum. Oh, and then say Stop. It wasn't like I came up with yum oh, like that's a cute phrase. I was trying to say yum, oh my God, but I had to stop saying, oh my God. So that's <laughs> the birth of yum oh. It there was not go. me making up a word. It was just shut up before you get in trouble. Yeah. Right. So similarly, is there a meal that you haven't quite figured out how to make into a 30 minute meal? Oh, there's a million. I mean, there's a lot of things that I love to eat eat and make. Something as simple as anything with eggplant in it, I always feel is a bit of a cheat to try and cram it into a 30 minute meal. I I do, I try, but I let eggplant drain like 20 to 30 minutes. They say that over the years, the, the most of the bitterness in an eggplant has been bred out of it, you know, as the 
agriculture has progressed over the decades. But in my mind, that's not true. Do you know what I mean? Like I, I'm too old, old man trapped in a lady body, you know. <laughs> So I still want to see it sit on a kitchen towel for 20, 30 minutes. And I'm sure it's kind of superfluous at this point, and I, I could get around not doing it, but I prefer it to just sit there for 20 minutes. Right. Right. But sure, there's many things you can't make in 30 minutes. Everybody knows that. But I think you adapt. I mean, you try like and adapt porchettas, just, obviously. Right, give a wink and a nudge to it. Porchettas, four days, so. But you can still make a ground pork sauce that has all of, it has fennel and rosemary and lots of citrus in it. And it would taste like porchetta, even though it's not. You could start with pancetta and put in the ground pork and put in your garlic and your rosemary and your fennel. All the things I use in rolling a porchetta and toss it with some pasta and put a little pecorino on it and say, that's delicious. Yeah, that's amazing. I mean, I love getting, I get texts when it was rebooted in April from like actual chef chefs. They're like, I'm DVRing all of these. <laughs> and I love seeing the people who like come out of the woodworks, you know, who were huge Food Network fans. Oh, there's a good one. Chicken parm. Very tough to do in 30 minutes if you do the flour, egg, breadcrumb thing and the pounding out. I mean, it can be done, but you're breaking a sweat. Chicken patty parm. Yeah. No problemo. And it's delicious. That was episode it's one. a giant ground chicken burger, basically. These beautiful little pizzettas made out of ground chicken and a whole lot of parm cheese. Oh, 30-minute timer. Timer. Well, you're going to have to go look up the recipe for the chicken patty parm. It's a winner. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Gabby. We got to sit again. I'm super excited for everyone to uh, check out the book. Pre-order on Amazon. Woo! (laughs) Quote, I constantly evolve as a person who cooks for a living. I think you have to challenge yourself. If you enjoy food, whether it's a hobby or your job, that's the fun of it, is that you're always evolving. Thanks again to Rachel Ray. Find more on her at rachelray.com. Find me and keep up to date with this podcast across all social media platforms at On Cappy's Plate or go to beyondtheplatepodcast.com. Beyond the Plate is on Twitter at BT Plate Podcast and Facebook. This episode was produced by myself along with Ian Cohen, Joe Yeaton, and Sean Petrosia. Thank you to Tom Osborne. Our music has been composed by Goldford. As always, a special shout out to my wife, Katie. Please rate, review, and or subscribe to this podcast on your listening site of choice. Join us next week for Just a Plate when Rachel and I have a little fun doing a mystery basket, if you will, for a surprise pasta dish. Thank you for listening to Beyond the Plate. I'm Cappy. And remember, there are never too many cooks in the kitchen. <laughs>